Okay, this was a really weird one to do for carriers. It really was, but to me, it illustrates so much of the role of carriers and of battle cruisers and of fast capital ships in general and speed of action that, frankly, it had to be done and it had to be done this way. But it was kind of curious in that I'm looking at many carriers over this year. Of which, of which, three of the conversions definitely come from battle cruisers. Three come from the Jackie Fisher battle cruisers of the Baltic, of which Furious is theoretically one. We'll get into this discussion. And two of the conversions come from battleships. Uh, it's Eagle, which is the other conversion battleship. The British have four conversions in total. Um, Courageous, Glorious, Furious, and Eagle. And Argus as well, but she's converted from a liner. And is a bit special anyway. It's funny to think that for quite a lot of the while, uh, quite a lot of the period of the naval aviation, the big names were conversions. And realistically, I would argue that Courageous, Glorious and Furious, despite not producing aircraft carriers anywhere near the size of Lexington and Saratoga, in terms of their capability and fit, although being very capable vessels, certainly intriguingly capable vessels, and having to go through a, quite a large amount of development work to actually get them to work, they were astoundingly, overwhelmingly, irrefutably more useful as aircraft carriers than they were as their first form. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if they were evaluated solely on the capabilities of their latter forms in life and how they performed in those years, they would be considered hmm, fairly good ships for a first generation of aircraft carriers. You could almost go so far as to say supremely a supremely adequate because they were they were adequate in every sense of the word for the role I know there's going to be someone coming here going but they couldn't do this that and the other and I'm going to remind you to look up the definition of the word adequate supremely adequate is what I'm saying so before you start coming in going they're not as good at this role that role as, a, as another nation as another ship Supremely adequate. I'm gonna. All I'll do is point you to the word supreme and uh, adequate, and tell you to go look up a definition of that. HMS Furious, though, is probably more than any other member of the class, shows the fact that these ships were produced by a knee-jerk reaction by an old man who has passed his time and should not have been in charge who had used politics, etc. to manoeuvre back into power and was no longer the man, the leader he'd once been, no longer the visionary he'd once been. Because there is, considering some of the orders he pushed through and some decisions he took, I often get into discussions about why I believe HMS Archincourt was going to be armed with six 18-inch guns. Not going to be a triple 15-inch gun, not going to be, you know... So, well, it's pretty much because... The triple turrets don't appear anywhere. The 18-inch guns do. The uh, small tube boilers appear. All sorts of things which were all, which they're only ordering for them to be ready when they are ready. It means they have to be ordered for HMS Sergeant Corps. She's the only ship which fits the timeline. Because she's weird. She's this sick ship tucked on the end of the Queen Elizabeth class. Which is apparently supremely difficult to build... And a whole new, new of new technologies, which is why they cancel her, 
when she's being built in the same yard which just built the which built the first Queen Elizabeth class vessel, HMS Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, so they've just they just built the first one of the class and didn't have any problems building that, but now they're having problems building their second one of the class, which is supposed to be exactly the same. But no, the really, really um, show-and-tell thing is the 18-inch guns on HMS Furious. Because A, she's... Broadly speaking, able to take two of them. And not in twin turret, in two single turrets. Now, here is the problem. If you're doing ranging fire... You do not want to be using single guns. Not at the ranges 18 inch and 15 inch are supposed to engage at. And you can turn around and go, well, she's built to go into the Baltic, Alex, and engage at closer ranges. And I'll go, I know, but she's got 18 inch guns. And realistically, no one's going to get to knife fighting range in that scenario. Because if they do, she's dead. She's not got the armor for knife fighting range. She's in her gun and do not swivel fast enough for knife fighting range. There is no way she should be at knife fighting range. And if you're at anything greater than knife fighting range, i.e. point blank range for those guns, you need to do ranging salvos to actually stand a chance of hitting. Which means in this period, uh, if you go by the technology of this period, you need models of three. You need at least three guns. Four will do. Six is, be six is the, be uh, the bare minimum realistically. Now how I know that? This is because when you look at the study that produces HMS Renown and HMS Repulse, they look at what is the bare minimum and they decide six guns. And yet Jackie Fisher, in the face of overwhelming argument from everyone, forces through two ships which have four 15-inch guns in two twin turrets. So, sort of enough to the ranging, but there's a turret at either end of the ship, so um, it's not that good. But you can sort of do it, but the axes are going to be very, very different. But you can sort of do it, and then Furious, with two single guns. That's what she was originally supposed to be designed for. She's never completed as that. Because, through her construction, Fisher falls from grace. He's removed from office. And instead of cancelling her, they can't restart the program those guns were made for. And we know you can work out pretty much what those program, those guns were aimed for. And pretty much the batch orders would have been... You would need nine, gu uh, nine barrels for a six-gun ship. And if you reconfigure the Queen Elizabeth class hull, you can fit three twin turrets... Four 18 inch guns. And the thing is about the interesting thing about the Renown and the minimum turrets is they say they've got that from an earlier design study which they have just comp which they completed in time period which leads up to HMS Argencore being ordered. Again, it's amazing. All this data keeps pointing towards Argencore as being the only logical solution for that scenario. For anyone who's thinking about a six gun ship prior to Renown and Repulse. Because everyone else they're building has got way more turrets. So dropping a single turret to get you down to six, and get six guns, that's an R-class. But they're not talking about R-class, then it's only a Queen Elizabeth. They're the only ones with four turrets before that. That are in the sort of configuration they can provide that with. And actually under construction. So, yeah. It's interesting. What they do is they look at them and go, we've got some of these 18-inch guns completed. Again, there are various reports about the guns having been a smoothed off end or various other things to shorten down the barrels so that they can be accommodated by HMS Furious because she can't take the weight. And certainly the idea of actually firing both guns from her hull does seem to be interesting when you consider the sheer damage done to her framing when they any time they actually fired the one gun she was actually fitted with. So Furious starts life as one man's ego project. One man's death trap for a load of people who aren't him. One man's 
I'm going to put this on a battle cruiser and produce it because I really like the idea of a battle cruiser and I don't like the idea of a fast battleship because that's wrong. Because that's not my idea. That's not what I want to do. And that produces Courageous, Glorious, and Furious. And Furious, as said, doesn't even get to complete in her plan form. He falls from grace. And that begins, therefore, her career as an aircraft carrier. She's never not an aircraft carrier. Her whole career, she is the evolutions of a carrier. She doesn't complete with both gun uh, with both turrets. She doesn't complete in any form. So from that perspective, you could argue she's the first vessel to be completed as a carrier. That's a warship. As an aircraft carrier. Admittedly, you've got HMS Ark Royal beforehand, etc. True. But Ark Royal is commissioned as a seaplane carrier. Furious is built and commissioned as an aircraft carrier. She's built from the keel up as a warship. And she's commissioned as an aircraft carrier. And mainly she still has an 18-inch gun on the back. But we'll get into that. We'll get into that. And, of course, I can't really get through one of these videos without saying thank you to everyone who supports the channel. Thank you to everyone who likes, shares, subscribes becomes a member of the channel, joins Patreon, Kofi, all those things. Because, honestly, without your support, I wouldn't be able to buy the necessary books. I wouldn't be able to do the field trips which support the channel. And I wouldn't be able to buy the necessary um, Iron Brew. Which, again, because this comes up periodically, is a soft drink. I know it's bright orange, but it is laced only with caffeine. And... Many, many large amounts of sugar. That is all it is. It is a Scottish soft drink. It is the Scottish soft drink equivalent of whiskey. In that you either drink whiskey if, you're, if you've got Scottish heritage, or you drink iron brew. Either way, it's a, it's a mild addiction which you cannot escape. I'd also say the other thing that this channel really does need support in. Thanks so many ways to my perfectionism and to my storing lots and lots of versions of every video I produce, so I've got them, should ever I wish to refer to them and check on them, is um, portable hard drives. Now, this is not, because I've re read recently that some people get shadow sponsoring, so if Toshiba would like to sponsor me, I'm happy to take the money, but I prefer it in portable hard drives, because I have to replay and get a new one of these with 4 terabyte space almost every two months now, I've realised. I used to think it was every quarter. And then I did the analysis. And I thought it had gone from every four months to every three months. It's actually gone from every four months to every two months. So, uh, yeah. Sadly, I don't get any sponsorship other than that provided. Well, yeah, no companies want to sponsor me. They will send me books to read. But, yeah, it's everything is thanks to your support. I wouldn't mind support from Iron Brew, Toshiba... Um, portable hard drives and iron brew would certainly make things a lot, a little bit cheaper and a little bit easier, but I doubt I'll get that. But that's literally, the, uh, that, that's literally, I, I was just, I was loving reading through the report of recent, uh, recently the European Union put out of how social influencers and etc, people who do stuff on social media, so many of, of those of people like, I suppose me, because I do this stuff on YouTube, are, um, secretly being sponsored by people and secretly to put stuff in and I'm sort of going big history anyone want to sponsor me no dang I really went into the wrong sector of this didn't I <sighs> dang but I'm, I'm trying for the tech with Toshiba here do you think if I, I drop one off because they're not cheap so you know and I, I, I buy a case for them as well which adds to the expense so Toshiba, want to do some silent sponsoring? Iron Brew? 
Anyway, back to the serious thing of HMS Furious, and this is how she looked as completed. This is why I say she's the first aircraft carrier is completed. She's built from warship built to be an aircraft carrier from the get-go. Because while she's not a full flat top, she's completed with a runoff and the various positions to a hangar, and she has the ability to carry and launch aircraft. And she also has that single 18-inch gun. And this is... This, there are so many points. That is a pointless addition on tomorrow, honestly. That really is. Basically, it makes a, a very large monitor. And honestly, that's a very cost-ineffective in, uh, co uh, cost monitor. Her first air groups, fighters, spotter aircraft, reconnaissance aircraft, those sort of roles... And there's a theoretical air group she has, and there's the actual aircraft which she gets loaded with, and those are two entirely different things. But she tries out a few other, a few types of aircraft, and she's basically pottering around, because the Royal Navy, when they complete her, no, they need aircraft carriers. Pretty much. The flat top becomes... An absolute British imperative, a naval imperative, the moment Jutland happens. Because one of the unofficial reasons for Britain's failure to do what it wants to do at Jutland is because their aircraft weren't able to communicate with the fleet and tell the fleet what was going on. And not only that, they couldn't land to tell the fleet what was going on. Or couldn't land to get their radios fixed. Because they'd have had to come down in the middle of the battle. And no one wanted to pause long enough to pick up an aircraft in the middle of the battle. Not even where they were sitting. Can't think why. So, yeah. The moment you have the Battle of Jutland, the discussions and concepts... Of permanent of constant operations start to seep into the Royal Navy, and this is the really interesting of HMS Bismarck, HMS Furious Ring. Why did I say HMS Bismarck? So I got I've got Bismarck up there on that side <sighs> because I got notes for something else. The whole thing of HMS Furious is as she's going through and they're looking at her, they're going, "Hang on, we need to do this. We need to be able to constantly launch aircraft." And the idea was, at this point, that they could launch and recover aircraft on the ramp at the bow. You can, you can express your own feelings about that. Myself, I, I would not like flying straight towards a transferus. I might be. I might be in a lighter aircraft that can be stopped by literally someone reaching out and grabbing me. But I don't want to be in that aircraft. I, I, I don't. I, I do keep saying that the pilots of this era were very, very brave. And this is how she looked as of 1918, because by 1918 they're preparing for the strike. Yes, the SOP with Cuckoo is being created. The first torpedo bomber. The Royal Navy is going to go and hit. Hit. The Kaiserliche Marine in harbour. They are going to burn them out of harbour. That's their idea, anyway. The idea is you, you churn, turn up with enough sop with cuckoos that you do enough damage. And the, uh, and the theory is that most of the torpedoes will probably hit the bottom of Wilhelm's Harbour, but some will actually hit a ship. And let's be honest, it's not as if the Germans are prepared for a torpedo attack in Wilhelm's Harbour. Why would they be? Why would they be? No one can do this. No one can drop torpedoes from aircraft at this point. There is... No one who's, you know, and do that sort of strike. There are seaplanes and, you know, by uh, various sort of things going around dropping torpedoes, but they've been doing it at sea in open areas. This is, this is Wilhelm Salvin. Who's going to attack us in harbour? The water's too shallow. All sorts of issues. No, and they, they have some anti-torpedo nets up, but they're not. They're not being properly maintained. They're not being properly organised. The British notice, the Germans notice, but the Germans don't see it as a threat because they don't think the British are going to do this. So the British are looking at this and they're looking at the ships which they're putting for us and thinking, well, this could be interesting. And honestly, I don't see the torpedo bombers achieving the level of success that the 
frankly, was achieved at Pearl Harbor, let alone Taranto, in, in for torpedoes dropped, because they sort of have fins coming on them, but the torpedoes in this period, the Navy, the Royal Navy, looking at, don't yet have the elongated wooden fins. They don't yet have some of the balancing within the torpedo designs that will come later, and they certainly don't have that lovely, lovely tension wire system which the British used to make their torpedoes belly flop for Taranto. And that's why the number of torpedoes dropped in Taranto uh, have a far higher success rate versus the number of torpedoes, uh, the success rate of the torpedoes at Pearl Harbor. Literally because of the tension wire. If you look at the Japanese aerial torpedoes and the British aerial torpedoes and you look at them, they're not the same. There are, of course, differences. But, honestly, when you go through the systems, the biggest, largest, most obvious difference is that tension wire and is the fact that their torpedoes therefore nosedive. And the tension wire is what allows them belly flop. And that, and if they belly flop, they run shallow. It's kind of like when you hit the water. If you are going diving in a swimming pool, if you dive in, you go deep and come up, which is why you go into the deep end. If you belly flop, which you should also do into the deep end, because doing it in the shallow end can squash people and yourself, so don't do it. I have to give this lecture to little cousins on a regular basis, so I will give this lecture. Do not belly flop into the, support of the shallow end of the pool. A, it'll hurt like the Dickens, but frankly, that doesn't matter for a torpedo. It doesn't have those kinds of feelings. And B, you don't go as deep. You don't. Because the way the water can resist you, because instead of cutting away into the water, you're trying to bash your way into the water. It doesn't work as well. And so, yes, the torpedo bombers might well drop from lower altitude, if you can imagine, and go slower than a swordfish. So that is also going to be a bit of a factor. But realistically, this is not, this is going to be closer to Pearl Harbor than is Taranto in terms of success rate. And there are going to be probably less aircraft there than Taranto. However, however, the Germans do have a habit of putting all their ships together in a row in the middle. And they're gonna take longer to start up than oil fired ships and they're gonna be less prepared. Probably even than the ships of Pearl Harbor were. So, and the thing is, this will be the first time. This will be the first ever such attack. It will have an impact. It would have had a massive impact. It could well have changed the face of the naval treaties in the 1920s and 30s. It could well have changed the interwar period in the 1920s and 30s. If a Pearl Harbor-like event happens, Toronto Pearl Harbor-like event happens in the closing days of World War I. The German high seas fleet is forced to withdraw from Wilhelmshaven. No longer is there such a thing as a fleet in being a safe fleet to hide in harbour because we can come and attack you in harbour. It's going to have a dramatic effect on the world. It really is. The thing is, the British don't forget that plan. They really don't. And post World War One, they w start working out how they can make that plan more and more viable. They start working out what they want from their aircraft carriers, from their aircraft. And this is Furious is one of the ships involved in this. Furious is one of those reliable ships. She's Looks like this from pretty much 1918 onwards. Honestly. She gets turned into this very, very quickly. She was originally completed in 1917. In her original form. And in this form, she's in 1918. And she pretty much from this point onwards is an important vessel in the fleet. 
And when I say an important vessel in the fleet, she's pretty much the aircraft carrier. She is the aircraft carrier. Until 1921. She is what the Royal Navy relies on when they talk about having an aircraft carrier or facilities with various fleets. This is her. She is it. While we're here, it's worthwhile considering the fact that, as you can see in this picture, but far better in this one, she is, in a way, a full-length flight deck. In a way. In a very, very special way. Because you land on the stern, and you can take off from the front, and there are ramps, which allow you to get around. In a way, it's a full-length flight deck, but thankfully, thankfully for everyone, she's not like this for a long time. But it does mean that when someone turns around to me and goes, you know what, it was really innovative, the Royal Navy, when they were looking at CVA-01 in the 1960s, and they were thinking about having a sort of route down the outside of the island structure so the aircraft could be brought around behind it for operation, uh, you know, to be stacked for operations and maintained away from the flight, main flight deck. It's a, it's a really innovative idea. I look at them and go, really? It's an innovative idea to have a route around the superstructure on the outside. Okay. Although, her service career, even while she's going through these changes, is actually pretty darn interesting. Because, again, it reveals the sort of cruiser carrier role and the strike carrier role and all the different roles the Royal Navy will be thinking about when it's trying to manage the situation with the treaties and getting the capabilities it needs from its aircraft carriers is what the aircraft the way it needs to do for its concept of naval a, naval aviation in the run up to World War Two. Her career in this period, while she's going for all these changes, actually illustrates it. She's attached to First Cruiser Squadron, along with Courageous and Glorious for most of the end of the war. But, yeah, she spends the vast majority of her interwar years serving in the Atlantic Fleet. And this begins in the 1918-1921 period. However, they have built Hermes. They have converted Eagle. They have all sorts of things going on. And eventually they decide we're going to reconstruct Furious. And it takes from 1921 to 1925. Four years. Now, you could say this is down to the difficulty of reconstructing a vessel with her design and hull spacing and various systems. True. You could also say, because it is in effect almost a complete and utter rebuild, it takes that time. True. That she's pretty much a new ship. In many, many ways. True. You could also say it takes this long due to the lack of experience with this design, and doing all this work requires a lot of effort and skill on the harder constructors. You're not going to get any arguments from me. You could also make the strong case, and quite a few people do occasionally, that the time it takes to reconstruct her, Courageous and Glorious, is also a wonderful job creation program that helps keep shipyards busy. All I will say is there are a lot of benefits to there being a lot of difficulties to overcome. There really are. And that the amount of time spent testing flight deck design in the National Physical Laboratory in Twickenham was really, really useful. 
reduce the rounded edges, all sorts of things to minimize turbulence. And that was part of what the Royal Navy was doing. The Royal Navy was testing everything. Furious was flush deck, like Argus. And said she has this lovely uh, navigating position slash chart sort of house forward. They're sitting in the flight deck center line. And let's be honest, you've got to love that. Because that means the moment you want to do any air operations, A, you've got to get out of the way. B, you're not going to have it available during the air operations. And C, oh my lord, if you're, if you're in any position near there while operating the carrier and an aircraft is taking off, you're going to have noise. You're going to have a lot of noise. She can normally carry roughly 36 aircraft. And please note I'm saying roughly 36 for a reason. One of the problems you have with aircraft numbers is that different navies have different definitions of what counts towards aircraft carried. Some just limit to the viable air group. Some limit it to the, include the aircraft which are stowed in pieces, half strung up from the hangar ceiling. Some include the aircraft stored in parts at various places below the uh, hangar of the, uh, the hangar. You know, in various maintenance spaces. The British only include aircraft which are in the air group. Please note you then have a lot of spare parts. A humongous amount of spare parts. In fact, some would say enough to actually build aircraft. Which might explain why some airframe numbers seem to have a curiously potted history in terms of their utility and use. Again, One of the things that's always a case and is very visible with HMS Furious is that she is and always will be for the Royal Navy kept on sort of a wartime footing in terms of how they approach disclosing information about her. And having true knowledge of her true capacity for aircraft, not her aircraft carried, i.e. air group in our Royal Navy circumstances, but aircraft capacity, that is something which is best left up to estimations. Capacity, though, isn't just something we measure in terms of aircraft numbers. If you want to measure the capacity of a carrier for its ability to operate, its capacity as a carrier, you've got to also talk about how it can generate strikes how it can generate missions and the thing about hms furious is she always no matter what her role when she starts out her career she's one of the larger carriers involved in the royal navy so she's used as a strike carrier that's what the role she sort of fulfills and exercises and her air group is orientated that way but as time goes on as her older in terms of construction younger in terms of conversion sisters courageous and glorious enter service and they're far larger air groups. She positions down to something equivalent to HMS Eagle. She's used as a fleet carrier, as a multi-purpose tool to support fleet operations. And realistically, this really comes from Jutland. It's, it comes from the British operations with surface radar, uh, surface radar, counter surface radar operations, counter surface raid exercises, surface raiding themselves in World War One, all sorts of things. But the idea of continual operations, of continual reconnaissance aircraft up there, continual fighters up there, up above a group, continual strike of aircraft availability, continual spotter aircraft availability, all these things are what British carriers are orientated around providing. Especially in the 20s and the 30s. It's the thing it, that they're oriented around this idea of being an integrated force multiplication unit. And it's a really interesting system. 
And it's one of the reasons why the British are also always pushing a multi-carrier concept of fleet operations, because again, it allows you to orientate carriers around certain things and allows you to guarantee you have flight decks available to continue the, to maintain the operations all the time. Night and day. Speaking of which, it's worthwhile noting that Furious was actually the first ever carrier to have a night landing. It's made by a Blackburn Dart, a torpedo bomber. Notice that other one? It's a torpedo bomber. On the 6th of May, 1926. And it's one of the things about Furious is she's key to developing a lot of the night doctrine for the Royal Navy. But they're starting. They're starting with it in 1926. And they've been working up towards it before then. The idea of a night doctrine and a night strike doctrine has been a strong part of the Royal Navy at this point since Jutland back in 1916. Decade on from there, and they are pushing on with it still. They're pushing on with it. And Furious is at the front of this. And Furious is a good aircraft carrier for this. She's about the right size. She's got the right sort of capacity in terms of spares and stores and all those things to maintain those aircraft operating. She's got space to maintain the aircraft. She's got the space for the personnel. Yes, she has problems. Please do not get me wrong. And when I do a key ships on her and her two sisters, the conversions, I'm going to go into all their problems in design and structure. But as the carrier of her time, she's a very useful vessel and they're able to work with her. I personally would, if you want to hear about one of the problems, I'll probably discuss quite a lot when I do the key stage, uh, key ships on them. Is the idea of having the stacks, the funnels, go down the length of the ship inside, and it just—it's the entire reason for Furious having such a smaller air group than her sisters. Is literally that. If you gave her an island structure, had the stacks go up vertically, up the island structure like they do in Courageous and Glorious, her air group would be exactly the same size and strength as theirs. Actually, it might be slightly bigger, considering the fact that she'd been altered earlier and had some more alterations done from the beginning, which made actually her ventral conversion slightly easier. So honestly, yeah, that decision to stick the stacks down inside her was just a terrible decision. <laughs> But it was the best for airflow they found. It created the, you know, when they were doing that testing as a physical laboratory, it was brilliant for airflow. It was the best for airflow across deck. It's only when you're actually practically landing on the carriers and you're doing it on a regular basis, you start to realize the importance of the island structure as a position for pilots to be able to measure their height above the deck as they're coming in and to orientate themselves on. And that while, yes, it creates a disturbance in the airflow, that disturbance, the problems caused by that disturbance is more than made up for by the benefits of it. And that's why you have the island structure. And that's why it's so useful. In terms of operation, all the other things, literally the disruption it creates versus the disruption its absence creates. Disruption of absence creates far more problems than disruption of presence. And so that's an ongoing thing with them. But that's furious. And the thing is, she's still useful in World War II. She's still used in World War II. In fact, there are so many what-ifs and alternate histories which can be put around HMS Furious just being available for operations. If she was available for operations, what could she have done here? If she was available for those operations, what could she have done there? And she takes part in the Norwegian campaign. She's carrying... Fer doing ferry duties at various points in the war. She takes part in operations with Force H in February 19 in 1942, early 1943. She takes part in the invasion of Sicily. Sicily. And Furious actually has a really important role in that. She was to allow a Joan reconnaissance aircraft to spot the British ships wait until it made a report, and then shoot that aircraft down. And if you think about that, that is a lot of work. That is a complicated operation to do. And they did it. 
they did it. Which is also quite a scary thing for them to do. But Furious remains one of the useful aircraft carriers for the Royal Navy to call on for the entirety of World War II. She's useful. When she joins the home fleet off the coast of Norway in 10th of April 1940, she's only carrying 18 swordfish. And has no fighters at that time. She's still useful. She deploys that morning. Well, next morning after she's arrived, realistically. Because she arrives sort of night, but morning after. Uh, 16 of her 18 swordfish to attack ships in Trondheim. It's unsuccessful, but they make the attack. She attempted to attack ships in Narvik on 12th of April, but it didn't work due to bad weather. They carried bombs, though, this time, instead of torpedoes, because the torpedoes had failed. They hadn't worked the way they were supposed to work in the fjords. It turned out in the fjords there wasn't as much space to manoeuvre as even in some of the harbours, and that caused problems. That caused problems. She'd actually taken part in some of the submarine sweeps, anti-submarine sweeps, in October 1939. She did, she did all sorts of operations throughout the interwar years. And this is her value. She can be used. She has space. When you need to load her up with Hawker Hurricanes, she can take them. She has the hangars, she has the lift capacity, she has the capabilities to do it. I have to admit myself, I prefer if she hadn't been being used for ferry duties. But the fact is, there is nothing else available. And she is the best of what's available. Definitely the best of what's available. She also has some gaps in her wartime service because she's sent for refit. She's useful enough she's sent for refit. One of the often questions put forward is well what's she doing when 4C happens in 1941? Well on the 7th of October 1941 she arrives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for her refit. And she doesn't leave and doesn't return to the UK until April 1942. And then she has to spend three months working up. That's a question and a half to work out. Whether if she hadn't been sent for refit, would she have been sent with 4Z? Would she have been enough for them? Probably. She needed the refit though. She really did. And... She spends time with Force H, as I've already mentioned. At several points during World War II, Furious, this carrier which starts life in World War I as, frankly, a monitor of sorts, is a really useful carrier in World War II. Carrying out testing, carrying out strike missions... Taking part in all sorts of operations. She's part of a force which is attacking Tirpitz in Operation Tungsten and other operations. She's actually, you know, when we think of British multi carrier operations, we probably don't think of Formidable, Indefatigable, and Furious joining together to try and strike Tirpitz on the 17th of July 1944 in what's called Operation Mascot. But she's there. She's there. With sea fires, hellcats, barracudas, and swordfish. This is actually one of the Barracudas taking off during Operation Mascot. She takes part in Operation Goodwood. She's placed into reserve in September 1944. She's paid off in April 1945. 
and then they use her to evaluate the effects of aircraft explosives on a ship's structure. She sold in 1948 for scrap and broken up in Troon in 1954. Well, by 1954, completely gone. Mostly it starts in 1953, but pretty much 19. And most of the, the work, most of the heavy work's done in 54. She was a survivor. She was a useful ship. And as I've said repeatedly in our keep saying, she's often the best available. And that's a scary thing to think about for most modern navies. The concept that the best ship you have available is not necessarily the best ship you have for the job. Because that ship's off doing another mission. Or that ship's sunk. Or that ship's needing to be repaired or is in maintenance. And in realistic terms, the best ship for a mission is the one that's available for it. Because it's the only one you have. Now that's HMS Furious. That is HMS Furious completely. She is a forgotten ship in many ways for the development of of naval aviation. You will hear people talk about Lexington Saratoga. They'll talk about the Japanese carriers. Maki and Akagi. They will talk about Ark Royal. Occasionally courageous and glorious. Sometimes you might hear about the losses of Eagle, of Hermes. People thought of talking about those, or the toughness of the illustrious class. The sheer swarm of the Essexes, but HMS Furious, you don't hear enough about. And yet, she was there. When those carriers hadn't yet even been thought of, let alone entered service, she was there, providing the foundation for the development of naval aviation, as we understand it today. She's not the best aircraft carrier, but she's often the best available. In fact, more often than not, she's the only one available. And the biggest what-ifs about her, the biggest what-ifs, are what would have happened if she had been available. If she had been available. If she had been taken off ferry duties a little bit earlier for other missions and sent to refit a little bit earlier. So it was available, let's say in 1941, or was available when the home fleet's out hunting the Bismarck. She's available then. So, instead of Victorious being the only carrier available, and her being with, well, King George V, and at that task for us, maybe Furious would have been with Hood and Prince of Wales. That is certainly British, classic British doctrine for dealing with a surface freighter threat. Carrier plus fast capital ships. And no, she's not the fastest ship in the world. She really isn't. But she is capable of 30 knots. And she was still fairly capable of 30 knots at this time. She'd been well maintained. She could have kept up with them. Certainly wouldn't have slowed them down. And would have given a strike package which could have changed things. But the thing is, you have and you fight a war with the carriers you built that are available. You start a war with X carriers. X is going to change depending on how many new carriers come into service and how many are lost and how many are damaged, and how many need to be refit, because using them in wartime is even worse than using them in peacetime, and peacetime does enough damage. Every change you make to history, every alternate history you postulate, every discussion you have about the decisions made at a time, can tell you one of two things. If done right, it can tell you not just what the people making the decisions at the time valued most, and what their system of values were based on. It can also tell you why. 
or two, it can be used to reinforce preconceived notions if it's framed wrongly. With HMS Furious, when people have brought her into discussions, they've often missed the reason she wasn't there. And the reason she wasn't there was because at an earlier point of time, something else was valued more. And then she required to be elsewhere. So, next week, hopefully, they will have arrived. They should arrive tomorrow. They, I'm told, they're in the Amazon have told me they will arrive tomorrow. At least two of them are coming from Amazon, one of them is not. Um, so the USN Aircraft Carrier Squadron System will be here. And I know I normally have a question at the end of these videos, but I'm not including one for Furious. And the question I'd put in for Furious is basically go and look up the service of HMS Furious. I know I'll do it again and I do a key ships video about them because honestly she deserves her own entry into the key ship series to work through her specs. But this was about her as a role, as a mission, as a service, not her specifications, her comparisons. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, please like, please share, please subscribe. It helps the channel grow. Please leave a comment. That's always nice. That helps all with the engagement in the logarithm. And yeah, if you want to support the channel, there is a many, many ways to. Watching with the ads, that helps. Uh, being a member of the channel, that's always useful. Joining Patreon and suggesting topics for the Thursday videos and the Saturday videos, that is always greatly appreciated. Because it's not just just suggesting topics, you get a vote on the topics as well. So even if you don't have the confidence or don't feel like suggesting topics, you get to be a, play a part in choosing what topics will be discussed. And I know, I have, there are many people I know who message me and go, I'm never going to suggest a topic. But I love being able to vote on which ones come through. Anyway, thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Take care.